Welcome to Bamford Rose and it's question of the week time. This week's question of the week is about identifying which manual gearbox V12 engine car you get yourself into the seat of. Before those pesky draconian environmentalist issues, consign the petrol engine to the history books. And in terms of large capacity, naturally aspirated engines fitted with a manual gearbox, then they are pretty much a thing of the past already. But you've got your 50 odd K and you're choosing which one to get yourself into the seat of. So let's just define the market and in terms of the Aston range, at the top end, we've got this V12 Vantage S manual seven speed manual trading for upwards of 120k now that's a manual with the seven speed gearbox and i'm not entirely sold myself on the seven speed gearbox i think gate selection is a bit fussy uh, meaning that compared to the six speed arguably the six speed offers the better driving experience the starting price for a six speed v12 vantage manual certainly these days it ranges from mid 70s upwards and then the V12 Vantage went to the V12 Vantage S, which was the seven speed paddle shift gearbox. And those cars can be found for about mid to late 80s. So with that six speed V12 Vantage manual price getting quite close to the later evolved car V12 Vantage S seven speed paddle shift price. With the S you get 565 bhp as opposed to 510. You get a lot newer interior, you probably get a lot better paint and better condition interior than the older six speed V12 Vantage manual car, meaning that you are paying a hefty price to have the manual. If it was my money, I wouldn't be going after that top end seven speed V12 Vantage manual car. And at around 80, 90K, I'd be having a bit of a discussion with myself to figure out if it was gonna be the older six speed manual V12 Vantage or the new V12 Vantage S paddle shift. So what about if the budget doesn't stretch that far and we've got a little bit less to play with? The DB7 V12 Vantage manual is a super rare car to find these days. So compared to a DB7 Auto, there's obviously gonna be quite a premium attached to the DB7 Vantage manual. Here's one for sale at 37,500. And unless it was a particularly poor example, maybe mileage was high, cosmetics were compromised, I don't think you're really gonna find one much cheaper than this. At the high end of the DB7 market, we've got the DB7 GT. And here's an example of a manual DB7 GT trading for about 53. We then go to the DB9 manual, which came in about 05, 06. Again, these are super rare cars to find. And I don't think starting prices are gonna be any lower than 40K at the moment. Here's a nice one for sale at 45. Now, Aston did make the 470 BHP DB9 in manual form for a short while, but those are super rare cars to find. Now you can find those specced with Bang & Olufsen and you've got the glass key and the evolved interior. If you can find one for sale, they're gonna be certainly no lower than 50. It's probably mid 50s, late 50s is the price for those. But keeping a lid on those prices is gonna be the entry level price for a DB9.2. DB9.2s seem to be starting for about 65K at the moment. With a very simple engine remap, you get that 500 10 bhp motor up to 565 the db9.2 has got electronic adaptive suspension carbon ceramic brakes and still retaining classic and understated looks if you were looking for a db9 manual at the top end of the range and the price was knocking on the door 60k you really do need to ask yourself the question would you be happier in 65k's worth of db9.2 okay you haven't got a manual stick shift but there's a lot of other comforts to be had for that extra few K. And arguably it's gonna be easier to live with in terms of maintenance and amount of visits to a workshop. But I guess if you're still watching at this point, it is because you want the stick shift. And even though the price is knocking on the door, certainly at the high end of a DB9.2, then you're still gonna choose that 470 BHP DB9 manual compared to your 510 BHP DB9.2 auto. The same overlap exists with DB7. DB7 manual can sometimes be the default choice, 
because I have a conversation with a prospective owner and getting in the seat of a DB9 isn't realistic, the budget won't stretch that far. Now there are some cheap DB7s out there, but DB7 is vastly growing into a car that's tricky to maintain in the workshop. As they get older, they just need more time lavishing on them and parts availability and time spent working on the car means that repair prices are arguably higher keeping a DB7 on the road than it would be if, if you were doing the same amount of miles on a DB9. To choose the DB7 over the DB9 is really all about the style of car that you're after. There's a certain charm to the older, more classic looking DB7. And for some people that ticks boxes so strongly that it doesn't matter if the price overlaps into DB9 territory, which is fair enough. I can understand why that happens. The only point of caution I would say is really do think twice about an inline six manual. And then when you've thought about it once, think about it again. The other consideration is the high price of the 450 BHP DB9s, what they're commanding in the marketplace. It's quite easy to see those knocking on the door of 50K and maybe a little bit over, but if a 470 BHP DB9 was found, mid 50s, late 50s, then with a better spec, bang and loss and stereo maybe, better dampers that car's on Bilstein as opposed to the 450 being on Dynamics, then you really are getting quite a lot for your money. So if you are buying at the top end of 450 DB9 money, then just really check that that car is worth it. Mileage is low, service history is good, paint's good, interior's good, and it really, really is worth the top spec premium. Anyway, that's enough waffle. Let's go and drive each one of those cars. Now, it's always worth going on YouTube and having a look at old videos such as Top Gear and stuff like that and looking about the reviews when these cars came out new. Most reviews today done by certain YouTubers are people that couldn't drive a greasy glove up a cow's bottom. And most reviews concentrate too much on just how quickly you can bludgeon the car around a corner. If you want to do that sort of antic in a DB7, then a DB7 isn't really the car for you. It's more of a GT Cruiser, and with the manual gearbox attached to the V12 engine, you just get to exercise the V12 engine in a bit of a different way than what you would have done if it was an automatic gearbox driving the car. Most things on DB7 are a little bit quirky, a little bit awkward. The seating position is really tough for me to get right, to get the distance on the arms right, to get the legs in the right place. And I think you've got to be quite lucky to really gel with the seating position of a DB7 with the adjustments that the seat and the steering wheel give you. Access to stuff like the handbrake, seat position, adjusters, nothing is ergonomic and comes natural. On one hand, that just adds to the quaintness of a DB7. Now most of the time you're driving the V12 engine with the manual gearbox, you'll short shift through the gears, probably changing up at about 3000 RPM. Between 1500 RPM and 3000 RPM, the pull this V12 motor's got is phenomenal. And if you really feel like going for it and you start revving it above 3000 RPM, then even if you start revving it to four, four and a half thousand RPM, you sort of feel like changing up anyway. If you had the DB7 with the auto box, especially the option that's got the Touchtronic gear selection available on the steering wheel, in reality questions, would you drive the auto any differently than how you're driving the manual. And the reason you drive like that is because you know you're in a bit of an old timer and you're not gonna push the car to the limits. For me at least, part of the engagement of a manual experience is changing up at the red line, downshifting, heel and toe, speed match gear changes, and being on it when you're downshifting. If you're just not driving a DB7 in that way and you're short shifting through the gearbox, you can achieve exactly the same with an auto and get the same driving experience out of it. As fantastic a car as this is, you really are paying a premium for that manual gearbox. And as we said earlier, if that premium encroaches into DB9 territory, then you really have to question, is a DB7 right for you? I do spend the bulk of my time driving new era cars and it's just so obvious when you get in DB7 that it is really driving like a car from last century. There's always a drive line imbalance, whether that's on the prop or the drive shafts. The diffs always make a little bit of a grumbling sound and it brakes, steers and handles like an old car. DB7 has only got ABS and traction control and that is if you give it too much gas 
traction control is going to stop the rear wheels from spinning. What you get in the DB9, as well as ABS and traction control, is dynamic stability control. And that's where the car realises that the arc you're taking isn't what is requested in the steering wheel position, and it's going to grab brake to take you on the arc, whatever you've set on the steering wheel. Now, I'm not about to attempt it in this DB7, but that is important because if you do start to push DB7, you will put this car out of its register, out of the window in which it likes to operate in, and it's very easy to get a bit of understeer, a bit of oversteer. Combine that with a feeling that you're hustling an old timer car, means that if you do push a DB7, the driving experience you're getting from it in return isn't that great. The DB7 has a front subframe attached to the chassis by the old-fashioned V-block assembly, as opposed to the DB9 having the aluminium front frame bolted to the tubular aluminium chassis. The DB9 has double wishbone, and especially in the case of the 470 BHP DB9, fantastic Bilstein dampers. That's important for two reasons. One, that explains the handling differences between these cars, literally there being a century difference between them. And the other, especially DB7s that have probably got 40,000 and above miles on them, then if they haven't had them replaced already, you're probably gonna be looking at a pair of suspension uh, V-block mount, subframe to chassis V-block mount bushes. You're gonna have to go through the suspension arms with new bushes. And whereas the DB9 is the extruded aluminium chassis, on this you've got steel. And there are some sections of the chassis on DB7 that's prone for rotting. Apart from the tubular rear subframe on a DB9, corrosion like that just isn't something you have to worry about due to the extent of how much that car is made out of aluminium. The corrosion, the repair bills, the extra time that the car takes to work on them because they're aging and stuff doesn't come apart easily. The yesteryear driving dynamics, all that added up, you really do have to question if DB7 is right for you. If it is, then that's great, and I have lots of DB7 customers that absolutely love their cars. It's just at point of purchase, you just have to double check that that is gonna be a marriage made in heaven. Now this particular DB7 is at the top of its game. Interior is fantastic, paint condition fantastic. Its maintenance history and upkeep records are really good and it's got 60,000 miles on the clock. If this was for sale in the marketplace, I reckon this would be a figure starting with a four. So let's now go back and get in the seat of that DB9 and we'll get in the seat of the 470 BHP DB9, which that particular car, its starting price is gonna be a figure starting with a five and let's go and see what that little bit extra money gets in terms of a driving experience. Before we go out for a drive, just sat in the seat of this 470 BHP DB9 manual, then this just feels more comfortable, more at home, makes you think you're in a sports car of this century. Seating position is fantastic, comfort position, fantastic, and everything we spoke about at the, about the DB7 being not exactly ergonomic, it is in the DB9. Now after that short acceleration there, this DB9 doesn't give you the same feeling to kick in that naturally instinctive bit of mechanical sympathy that you have when driving a DB7, which is really the main factor limiting you to uh, revving it to the red line. It's a sports car of this century and it doesn't complain if you put it to use. For me, a DB7 only works out if there's a huge price differential between that and the DB9 manual. If a DB7 at the top of its game, like that 53K DB7 GT is to choose from, or it's the DB9 such as this one, there'd have to be some really strong compelling reasons why you'd choose that DB7. Now we're traveling along on the same piece of road at the same speed, and this DB9 on its Bilstein dampers it's just soaking up the bumps in the road. Whereas that DB7 was bouncing all over the place, 
the feel from the brake pedal returns the feeling of a brake assembly that can actually brake the car down from speed as opposed to the DB7 where it all felt a bit under braked and you were overheating the brakes. And because of its double wishbone suspension and because the front subframe isn't attached to the chassis with V-block bushes, the ride and handling in this car is just so much more composed over the DB7 at the same time as being more sporty and agile. If you had to daily the car, then the DB9 would be totally at home being used as a daily it's not really practical to daily use a DB7. This sort of critical assessment is necessary because a few years ago, DB7 had depreciated and plateaued at the bottom of resale values. And now DB7 is massively appreciating. It's a classic. DB9 is like DB7 was a few years ago where it's just finished depreciating and it's pretty much bottomed out at the lowest figures I can see them going to. The nostalgia of a DB7 and prices that are appreciating. If we are saying the DB7 is a bit of a GT Cruiser, then if I was gonna set sail in a DB7 and go off to the south of France or Spain, you'd really needed to have maintained that DB7 in a garage before that trip to stand any chance of thinking you're going to make it without needing a tow truck. So if that GT Tour is going to be your use of the DB7 manual and you compare it with the DB9 manual which is arguably more comfortable to make the journey in and is arguably less likely to need a tow truck compared to the DB7. Don't get me wrong we're certainly not beaten up on the DB7 it's just that you need to think about all these points before making a purchase. Because if you think about it rationally, if you're after a car like this one approaching late 50s, for that little bit extra, you could be in the seat of a DB9.2 Auto. And together with questioning whether it's DB7, DB9 450 manual or DB9 470 manual, a big part of this video is actually questioning whether you really do need that manual. And you still have a smile on your face if you were driving the Auto, but you get the smile for other reasons. You'll be in a lot newer and higher spec DB9 and all together as a complete package that could turn a more rewarding experience than the slightly older, less specified manual versions. But just like many of these considerations, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no one size fits all. If you've made the transition from DB7 manual to DB9 manual, then we'd really like to hear your feedback. Hope you enjoyed that question of the week. As always, it really helps us if you can subscribe to our channel. If you like what we do, click us a like. Give us your comments and feedback and we'll see you on the next question of the week.